Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, welcome to the Open Forum. And uh, we've got a fascinating hour and a half ahead of all of us today. Today we're talking about belonging. It's probably the most important issue of our current history because we're more fractured than we ever have been before. We have more information at our fingertips than ever before, more connectivity, and yet somehow we seem to know less. If you want to get the news today, you will probably go to a source online that confirms what you already believe. And the danger is that we are now all trapped in our own echo chamber and our own filter bubble. And that magical thing called a shared experience where we all come into a central space together and exchange ideas, connect as human beings and learn from each other but debate in a respectful way that's rapidly disappearing. But I'm on this stage and I'm looking at you. And what I think I see is that beautiful thing called a shared experience. I bet you're all very different types of people who believe in different things. But you showed up. You're here. You're present. And that gives me personally great hope. So one of the issues in society that divides us right now around the world is immigration. And when we talk about belonging, it raises very interesting thoughts and issues about who we are as a global society. I live in America, and uh, certainly immigration is a huge issue in America. Families are being torn apart, families that belong together because of a flawed immigration policy. So I wanted to learn about the front line of this complicated issue. And uh, I decided to uh, uh, spend a year and a half of my life documenting this complicated issue as a photographer and as a storyteller. So we went to the border with Mexico. Uh, I went to morgues where people die trying to cross the border. Uh, I went to uh, halfway houses. I, 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 it was an extraordinary experience. And one day, I was uh, at an immigration march to change our immigration laws. And I was watching all the people go by holding signs, marching for unity. And I saw a mother, and she was walking down the street, and she was with her three-year-old little girl. Her little girl was called Evelyn. And she was beautiful. Evelyn was wearing a T-shirt. And on the T-shirt, it had in black painted letters, free my dad. Now, Evelyn is a citizen of America. Her mother is a citizen. But Evelyn's father was an undocumented worker. And he had recently been found without his proper paperwork. So they put him in a detention center and he was waiting to be deported. So, Evelyn made a t-shirt with her mother before the march that tells the world that she wants her dad to be freed. I knew as a photographer and as an image maker that this picture could be an incredible vehicle to help us all understand a human problem. Data tells us one thing, but humanity tells us something else. So I went up to the mother and I said, excuse me, your little girl, she's fantastic. And I said, her t-shirt is very powerful. Do you mind if I take a picture? And the mother said, sure. So I turned my camera to the little girl. And she did what my kids would have done when they were three years old. She was frightened. Who is this strange man pointing a camera at me? So she hid behind her mother's legs. That is not the picture I wanted to take. A child who's frightened as a victim hiding behind her mother. I wanted to capture that sort of empowerment that I saw from this little girl who was marching the streets for human dignity. So for me to earn the right to photograph the little girl, I had to play balloons with her for five and a half hours. Now, eventually, she turns to me and she says, picture. I had now earned the right 
to take a picture. I photographed so many heads of state and government and all our living American US presidents, and I never had to play balloons with any of those guys to earn their trust. But little Evelyn, I had to work so very hard. So I took a picture. Guys, would you show everyone the picture that we have ready? There she is. And as I took the picture, I turned round to her mother and I said, I have to tell you that I think I've just taken one of the most important pictures of my life because through this image, I will be able to show the world how important humanity and belonging really is. The mother was very uh, pleased and uh, she said to her daughter, you did good. The photographer man is very pleased. And the little girl says, Mommy, if I did so good, does that mean Daddy can come home? Belonging is essential to humanity. We're better when we think of our partners and our neighbors as fellow citizens in a global family. And we have to find a new way of building those bridges. So I'm very honored to share today's platform with three extraordinary people who uh, have the idea of belonging embedded into their work, but they're all very different. We're dealing with, uh, we're dealing with machines, we're dealing with people, and we're dealing with animals. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time introducing them, because if you're here, you already know who they are. But I would like to begin by introducing a very young, emerging talent. I think this young man uh, is going to be one of the most extraordinary photographers of his time, if he stays the course and keeps his game high. But the talent is extraordinary. His name is Sky. And I said to him, I'm a simple man. I want to know how you describe your job. And he said, in simple terms, I take pictures of animals. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Sky. So thank you very much, Patel. If you didn't realize, I'm a wildlife photographer. So this has always been a dream of mine to do wildlife photography. And it's something that I've been doing since I was born. But before we get into all of that, I thought it better be the right decision to tell you what makes being a wildlife photographer so fun and so special to me. During my journey as a wildlife photographer, I've been put into some very interesting situations and learned so much from the bush and nature. And I feel like I've been in, fortunate enough to grow up being a part of that and feeling belonging in nature as humans should be. I've been fortunate enough to go canoeing in the Great Zambezi River in Zimbabwe and come face to face with elephants while doing so. I have walked with the Samburu people through the Kenya and I've gone cable carting across the border between South Africa and Botswana with crocodiles swimming beneath me. I've also been able to experience the true beauty of the Ngorogoro crater in Tanzania. And with that being said, I think it's only right that I share some of my close encounters with wildlife because that's what you're here to listen to, from me at least. In this picture in particular, I went to go try out a macro lens for the first time. And for those of you that don't know, it's a lens that lets you take pictures of very small things. Now with this, I wanted to go and get my camera. And that's when I saw this orange blur run straight past me. And in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, it's not big enough to be an animal. It's not a bird. It doesn't have wings. But it's an insect. So I went to go get my camera, and I rushed to it. And that's when somewhere along the line, the chaser became the chased. And I was being followed by one of the most horrid creatures I had ever seen in my life, called a solifuge. I like to call it a mixture of a spider, a scorpion, and a whole lot of ugly. But anyway, to cut a long story short with this uh, encounter especially, I ended up crawling up to it very slowly because it's quite an erratic animal or insect. So to get up to, close to it and get a picture of it, it's very, very hard. And a lot of photographers actually struggle to get that intimacy with the, with the insect. With this photo in particular, as I got closer, it flared its pincers as a warning signal. And that's when I knew I got the photo I wanted because I wanted to show what it's like to be the, on the receiving end of one of these insects attacking you. Straight after this, I looked at my LCD, which is a little camera screen, and I realized that when I looked back up, it was gone. And that's when I felt something crawling up my leg and down my back. 
So as you can imagine, I was glad I was cocky that day, and I needed a cherish of pants before I went to my next game drive. <laughs> With that being said, I think it's only right to talk to you about the time that I was charged by a leopard. Tortoise. <laughs> It was during one of our stays in Mashati Game Reserve when I went to go on a, one of my favorite hills in the area to talk to my family about all of the sightings we had seen and see the setting sun of Africa. During this, I noticed one rock in particular. And I thought, you know, it's just a rock. Paid no attention to it. It's so rocky in the area that it didn't, it didn't rent any space in my mind. After a long talk with my family about all the sightings we had seen and all the things we had learned, I realized that the rock had moved. It was gone. And that's when I went to go and investigate. And that's when I got this picture. I figured out that it was a leopard tortoise and crawled up to it to try and get the shot I wanted as the sun was setting to get almost a silhouette type of feel. This picture wasn't as easy as it looked though because although it looks like a beautiful picture in my opinion, I had to crawl up to it on a whole bunch of rocks so my elbows were grazed and I ended up taking it on top of a thorn bush. So I was also impaled a couple times. But it was all worth it because I got the photo I wanted. Now I've talked to you about a lot of the smaller creatures that I've had close encounters with and I feel like it's only right to show the same amount of respect as we do for the lions and the leopards as insects and the birds. But with that being said, I've also had equally close encounters with the larger animals, such as when I came face to face with this big crocodile. This is in the Okavango Delta. We were drifting down a river and that's when I managed to get the shot as it emerged from underwater. I've come face to face with male lions and I've come so close to two bull elephant fighting that I couldn't take a photo anymore because it was just too close for my focus to focus on them. With all that being said, I think it's only right to start off with my story. So with that being said, this is my story. From the day I was born, nature and wildlife photography had always been a big part of my life. And my parents had always been something that had been a driving force for conservation and also photography in general. Throughout my journey, I was always taking photos and being inspired by what my dad did, because he was a very passionate wildlife photographer in particular. And I remember asking him if I could use his camera almost every day, which he'd always reluctantly respond with, OK, but don't drop it, or we'll use you as lion bait. So as such, I made sure I didn't drop it, no matter what. So during this time, after all my constant whining and taking photographs and ended up using my dad's camera more than I did, more than he did, I ended up getting my first camera, which I actually brought here today. I called this camera the Pocket Rocket, and it was my very first camera that was exclusive to me. It was really special because not only was it small enough to fit in my pocket, and I could take it around everywhere, but I was also able to use it as my own platform for photography. It was my pictures. It wasn't something like my dad. I used my dad's camera. That's why I got the photo. It was now all about me. I, with this camera, I went all over the game reserves and took photos of everything. And when I say everything, I mean absolutely everything. I remember going and taking one of my, fir my first pictures of a blurred in Yala. And let me tell you, we all had to start from somewhere because, gosh, that picture's bad. <laughs> I look back on it time to time, and it reminds me of where I started, how I came from, and how far I've come as a photographer. Opa, what happened there? I started to realize with my photography through the years that I wanted to capture what I thought the true essence of nature photography was, as it was something that I've been brought up with and was so passionate about. I remember going to doing local game reserves and thinking to myself, what am I doing here? Why am I feeling so special? Why does it make me feel so humble that I'm so close to elephants and zebra and giraffe just like this one? And that's when it came to me that people belong in nature. It's the way it all should have been. Without all of this technolo technology and the advances in robotics and all of that, we would still be there. But in the same sense, we need that in order to progress as humans. I remember one truly gruesome sighting of an elephant in particular. Now this elephant was shot while crossing the border between South Africa and Botswana. It was shot and ravaged for its skin for the black market, for its use for medicinal purposes. I don't know why, but they did it. And this is when it dawned on me that what my dad had told me as a youngster, that, wildlife, that we should always be grateful for every animal sighting that we see, because you don't know when they're not going to be there anymore. And the animals you photograph today might not be there tomorrow. And this is how it all brought me into my own type of photography, and how I wanted to show people the reasons why we should be protecting nature. 
and to show the beauty of nature because it's a beautiful place. But I realized that not everybody's able to go to nature, so I had to bring it to them. This is when it dawned on me that I should show nature for what it is, both the ugly and the pretty. Because people don't want to protect something that they don't know enough about. And I feel like a message is just a message. But when accompanied by a picture or a video, people can feel so inspired and passionate about something. And they actually feel like they're a part of the, the solution or they're a part of the problem. And it's only when we can understand that that we can actually go forward and try and make a difference. The picture you see behind me is my first ever awarded picture called Vanishing Lion. It's a picture of, that talks about the harsh reality of how low the lion population in Africa was and how fast it was steadily decreasing. I tried to use a new technique as an 11 year old and I wanted to try and capture almost a video type of uh, picture but all captured into one type of frame. After a couple of failed attempts, I realized that it wasn't working. So I tried again and again and again, different settings, changing, fiddling around and then I got this photo that you see. Immediately after I took the photo, I looked at it and it reminded me about how the lines were vanishing from our planet. It almost as looked the lines were, were fading away from our screen or vanishing, they were blurred. You can't see them clearly anymore. And I think that that's what, it, what I tried to show with my picture was that we've lost sight of what nature is. We're starting to blur the lines with nature and what we should be protecting. To this day, lines are one of my favorite picture, animals to take pictures of, as you can see from the pictures behind me. These are all from one of my most recent trips to Mashati Game Reserve in Botswana. And with that being said, I've talked to you about the, a competition called the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. I previously mentioned it as when I placed with my Vanishing Lion picture, which placed in the under 14 category in 2014. Now, this competition is a competition like no other. And in the words of myself, it's the Mount Everest of wildlife photography. It's a place where over 45,000 entrants from across the globe enter and it's hosted and exhibited at the Natural History Museum in London. It's a place where it's a celebration of wildlife and conservation all, in all together. And this year, well, actually last year now, time's flown so quickly, I, got, I achieved the dream of, I've got the award of my life and my dreams came true. And I was awarded with the Young Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Now what this means is my photo was represented as the best under 18 photograph and it's the highest achievement that a phot photographer from under the age of 18 can achieve. But before I get into what picture actually started all of this and how it won, how I won, what the story was, I thought it would only be right to start from the beginning. This is back when I was 11 years old and we went to a place called Kenya and this was before my mom's 40th birthday. We went with a person called Greg DeToy who was the soon to be, young, uh, the soon -to -be wildlife photographer of the year. And I was super fascinated with what he could do with the camera and he really inspired me with his whole perception on what photography could do for conservation. So he inspired me as a person, and as soon as he, I started to learn from him and talk to him, I realized more and more that this is what I wanted to do with my life. I remember one, one sighting in particular where, on this trip where I took this photo, and I went up to him and I asked him, do you like it? Immediately after, he went to my parents and said, you know what, your son has a, he's got a gift, and that you should try and nurture it. He said in a couple years' time, he might be able to make it into the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards, but to his dismay, I made it the next year, and me and him went to London together. Now, throughout this whole journey, it's been such an awesome experience, and it's always been a dream of mine to win a category, nevertheless, to win the whole entire award. And it's because of this fact that it was just mind-blowing to me, and to, for me to be given a platform to share my work and my goals with photography, it just meant so much. I'm just going to show you a couple pictures now because they're very good. So this is when my whole perspective on photography started to shift. After four years of not making it into the exhibition, I thought that there was something wrong with my photography. I thought I was doing something wrong or my pictures just weren't making it. And that's when it dawned on me. Some pictures made it and others not. And the reason that some made it was because people felt something when they looked at it. They looked at it once and it was a nice photo. But then they looked at it again and they started to think. And that's when I came in. I wanted to show the beauty of nature and all I needed to do to change this whole conundrum of me not being able to place and be given a platform 
was to change my perspective. I wanted to start showing the beauty of nature, but not just the exotic animals, not like the lions, not the elephants, not the big five. But I also wanted to show that even the common animals that are also known as boring or mundane can be beautiful if given the right approach. And that you don't need to see exotic animals. All you need to do is have an exotic approach. A picture I liken this to is a picture you see behind me called Dawn of the Beast. It's a picture of a wildebeest marking its territory, which doesn't sound very <laughs> photogenic, does it? <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, wildebeest, male wildebeest in particular, they do make a poo to mark their territory and they dig up a whole bunch of dust. So a lot of people wouldn't actually take photos of this because it's not something very photogenic. But I saw an opportunity to make a difference and to show people that even something like that can be beautiful with a change of perspective. So for this picture in particular, I saw a chance with the morning, uh, with the sun rising in the morning. So he drove around to get a bit of backlight and get the silhouette type of feel. And I got the picture you see behind me. A lot of the time when I take photography, when I take photos, people always ask me, why do I do it? And it all comes down to one thing. I love wildlife. I love photography. And most of all, I love sharing what I like to do with the world. And that's how it dawned on me that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to share my love, my passion, and why we should be protecting our natural world with the people around us. This year, was, so this is the picture that actually won the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Youth Award. It's called Lounging Leopard, and it's of, a pic, it's of a leopard that I've been taking photographs of for the last eight years. So it's a leopard that I've actually got to know quite well. We call her Lumpy. And the reason she got this name is because she broke her leg as a young cub from falling out of a tree. So it's really a miracle that she survived for so long. The reason that I have such an attraction to this leopard in particular is because although she's been injured, and it's a miracle that she can survive on her own, she has to hunt twice as often as more other leopards because her kills get taken by hyenas because she can't drag them up a tree. And to see that she's doing so well, even though she has this disability, makes me feel like no matter what I do, as long as I keep it in mind that if I work hard enough, I can be like Lumpy and I can achieve what I want to. So she's just had her second litter, which uh, this is a picture of her and her cub that I've recently taken. And it's really special to me because not only do I, have I grown up alongside of her and grown as a photographer with her, but I'm also being able to carry on the generations. And now that I'm the, wildlife, the young wildlife photographer of the year, I can now focus on her cubs and show the next part of my story. To sum up, I'd just like to say that overall, I believe that the youth play a very important role in saving our uh, planet. Not only because we have the ideas and the time and the energy, but because we are also the people that have to fix it. We're the people that are gonna have to suffer if we don't make the change. And I believe that it's only when the generations before us and my generation and the ones below come together that we can make the difference. Because let's be honest, all of you sitting in front of me, you're all adults, except for two, three, my apologies. But you guys have the experience. We have the time, we have the energy. And it's only when we can combine those that we can actually make a difference. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Sky. Amazing, right? Absolutely beautiful. And uh, from someone who represents the future. So uh, I think that's just, uh, Sky, you're very inspiring. Uh, and, you know, the photography world needs young blood. We need you. You know, you must never think that because you're an emerging talent that, the, that there's a sort of... Um, there's a supremacy and then you're, you're, you're more vulnerable than the others. You hold the future in your hands. So thank you for your commitment and just make us a promise that you don't ever stop, okay? So um, next, I would like to invite Madeline on stage. I asked her um, what she does for a job and she said, I talk to robots. So uh, this is going to be a very different experience, I'm sure, but I can't wait to see what Madeline's going to say to us all. Madeline, would you like to take the stage? Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. 
Um, today, I am going to talk about robots and our future with these machines. Um, in my background, I'm not a roboticist by training. I'm a roboticist by practice. And uh, throughout my career, I've been called many things. I've been called an artist, a scientist, a researcher, and also a robot whisperer. And uh, what that means is really that I can have this ability to convince machines to do things that they were never designed to do. So today, I want to talk a little bit about where we are with robots. It's, it's really an incredible time to be alive now with a lot of technical advances that are happening that have been in the works for 50 years. Well, they're starting to come to fruition now. When you think of robots, what picture do you have in your head? Does it look something like this? Or maybe something like this? This is what uh, science fiction has told us what our future with robots will be. But these machines really are machines that are made in our own image. They're modeled after us. They look like us. They have eyes. They have hands. They have mouths. They speak our language. And that's not actually the type of intelligent, autonomous machines that are beginning to join us in our world. The actual robots that are joining us on our city streets and skies look more like this. Yeah? Maybe some of you ha actually have this in your home. And while some might think that this is a little disappointing, I am super, super excited about having these incredible machines that can do things that humans can't, can navigate to places that we can't reach, can bring and transport things in hospitals, for example, can make us uh, go to point A to point B at speeds faster than I can run, for sure. These machines that don't look like us, these non-humanoid robots, have amazing abilities that we don't have, and they're starting to join us in the world. In fact, there's an entire robotic ecology that's starting to emerge from uh, four-legged robots that are delivering packages from mailboxes to houses to drones, again, that uh, capture our, our uh, most precious moments and candid moments out in the wild to industrial robots that make a lot of the things that we experience on a daily basis. And when we look at robotics from the lens of ecology, we can learn a lot by our relationships with the animal kingdom, for example. So like what we saw with Sky's uh, presentation, we have an, a, a relationship with animals that has evolved over millennia. There's animals that are domesticated, animals that are tamed, and animals that are wild. Well, our future with robots will have these same sort of dynamic relationships. We'll have machines that we want to be around, these domesticated robots that are kind to us and attentive to us. We'll have machines that are tamed, that are useful, but perhaps also dangerous, but their utility outweighs the, the risk of using them. And then there will be machines that are wild that we never really want to cross paths with. And this entire ecology is really just at its nascent beginnings. And it's something that, that uh, as technologists, we're creating these things and they're starting to infiltrate the world at scale. Today, I'm going to share a little bit of work regarding taming, taking machines that were designed to do one thing and getting them to do something completely different that they were never intended to do. I'm really passionate about inventing better ways to communicate with machines that can make things. For a long time, industrial robots have been the culprit of automation and replacing human labor. Basically, all the easy tasks to automate have been automated. Now what we're working on is um, using these tools to enhance or augment human labor. And that to me is very exciting. Industrial robots are really fantastic CNC machines, you put a different tool at the end of the arm and all of a sudden they can do a whole different thing. So in the morning you can be doing spot welding, in the evening you can be doing painting, it's just highly adaptable. Another thing that I'm really working towards is finding ways to bring these machines out of factories and into live environments. So onto construction sites or onto film sets. 
there's chance for unpredictable objects like people to be moving into the environment. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to build the system to give this robot eyes so that it could actually see me and we can safely collaborate in a shared space. If I'm wearing or if I'm holding these motion capture markers, it knows where I am in space, it knows how I'm moving in space. Now all of a sudden we can give the machine a nuanced understanding of our intention in that space. You can get someone who's never seen a robot before and have them begin to do creative things with just a couple minutes of interacting with the machine. So in developing the software uh, for ABBA here, my big orange robot, she's my, she's my dancing queen, that's how she got the name. Um, we spend many, many hours together. And usually, these robots, they have very, very boring lives. They live in factories, on assembly lines, doing very short, repetitive tasks over and over again. And by building this software that let this robot see me, give, give its attention to me, and follow me along the lab, I started to feel less like a programmer and uh, a little bit more like this. Like I was some sort of animal tamer uh, with this big beast of a machine eagerly following me around the lab. And it was really intoxicating. It, it was a discovery that I didn't anticipate making. The fact that this machine with no eyes, with no mouth, with no human signals can still feel so lifelike just by the way it moves, just by the way it sounds. So this is their normal life, right? The, these machines live in factories. Uh, they are, have amazing abilities. They can lift cars over their head, move at superhuman speeds with superhuman accuracy forever. And when we want to interact with them in a, in a normal context, this is usually what it is. This is human-robot interaction at its most advanced currently. Strict separation between the human and the robot. And there is really good reason for this. Um, the robot is made of hardened steel and I'm made of soft, squishy flesh. And those two things usually don't go well when they come in contact with each other. And you even see this, you know, the, the logos in the user manual for the robots sort of reinforce this danger. So in my research studio, what I focus on a lot is how to find clever solutions around these entrenched problems in robotics, whether making them safe to touch or making them easier to use and to learn. I've worked with big giant machines and I've worked with small agile machines. Everything to try to get these robots to be more attentive to us. What I'm really passionate about is inspiring others to get engaged in what our future comes uh, out of the lab in. So in my work, I do work in an in a, uh, academic sense, um, but I also try to engage cultural institutions to bring these things that are coming out of the lab into the wild so we can have a social conversation about this. And I was fortunate enough to be invited by the Design Museum in London to exhibit at their inaugural show, Fear and Love. And the curator invited me to create an immersive installation that would help us think about what our future with automation and intelligent machines might be. So I decided to bring an industrial robot to live in the museum for six months, almost as if it were a zoo creature. And the idea for me was, let's just give people a, a chance to come face to face with this companion species of, uh, of ours that is really working behind the scenes of our everyday infrastructure. So let me introduce you to Nemus here. Here she is uh, greeting the ceiling installers. Um, and as you can see here, that she's looking at everyone's body and, and she's acting almost like an animal. She has an attention span. She's allowed to get bored. She's allowed to find you super interesting and get really excited. And when you try to get machines to do things that they were never intended to do, it involves a lot of custom software development. That's mostly what I do on my day to day. I do talk to robots, but through software that I develop. Um, so here, Mimas, she doesn't see the world the way that we see the world. She has sensors embedded in the ceiling that sees people from above, almost like a bird's eye view of the world. And then from that, I can extract really useful information, how, where a person is located, how long they've been there, how excited they are. And we can begin to infer a ranking system that helps Mimas figure out who she should go visit. 
Now this robot, this non-humanoid robot, um, really has a simple way to communicate just through its posture, its motion, and the sound of its motors. That's its native language as it was born from the factory. And so I did my best to try to really emphasize what we can do, how we can communicate at a primal level with these machines with just basic instinct and gestural communication. And so here she is brought to life at the museum. I find it's very important, especially for people who are out there deciding how this technology enters the world, to begin to engage outside of industry and outside of academic research labs. For me, the highlight of this whole experience was spending the day with these grade 10 uh, students in London, teaching them about the technology and seeing just how quickly they could pick up on the breadcrumbs I left behind for how this system works. What's heartening for me as well is that these kids, they have a different definition of a robot. It's not this mechanical drone. It's this attentive creature that's just kind of happy to see them. And that's how they're moving forward in the future. So part of the benefit of doing a highly public presentation is that you can use social media as a nanny cam to keep track of your robot from a continent away. And it was really great to get this unsolicited feedback for what emotional responses people were having to Nina's. And so some people thought she was friendly, and some people would begin to tease her a little bit. And uh, some people uh, were thinking of a little more uh, lewd things for her. But there's also space in a museum context, in a cultural context, for uh, concern to air. People who thought it was kind of creepy that this big beast of a machine would lunge for me so excitedly. Uh, uh, like, sh shouldn't we be distrustful of that? A really valid position to take. And this feedback from Nemus at the Design Museum in London really folded into my next exploration, Manus, which was commissioned by the World Economic Forum this past September in China. And the idea here was to give an opportunity to explore what our future with many autonomous machines, not just one big one, but many autonomous machines might be. So Manus here is a set of 10 industrial robot arms that are programmed to behave like a pack of animals. Now you see all the robots acting individually here, but one of the amazing things, one of the amazing new abilities about autonomous robots is that their mind and their eyes don't need to be connected to their body. All of these robots have one central brain, and that's how they get these rippling behaviors that connect. And just like Mimas, Manus requires custom software. So here, instead of a bird's eye view, she has a worm's eye view of uh, the world with depth sensors looking up from your ankles out into the world. It's always a challenge when, when you try to get technology to do things it wasn't intended to do, uh, to reinvent your tools over and over again. But it's been a pretty wonderful experience when all of the hard work uh, culminates into someone actually experiencing and coming face to face with the machine. And again, the physical design of this, this nine meter platform, illuminated platform containing these 10 robots also uh, continue to add to the flavor of, of this as a caged animal that has been brought on exhibit. So here they are reacting to your body language. They look for hands, they look for arms and heads, um, and they look for, uh, the, again, the most interesting person that's around them. And they can change their mind at will who the most interesting person is. This experience in Tianjin was really wonderful for me, um, not only for just the crowd of people that are, in, in China in particular, that uh, industrial robotics are making a huge impact in their labor market, 
um, but also to be around lots of important people uh, that in intend to walk up to the robots to command them, and then the robots sort of get bored and go look at someone else. That's a, that's a really fun feeling. But I want to leave you with a couple thoughts here while this plays out. For me, everyone has a right to the future. Everyone has a right to decide how technology engages their life. Whether it's autonomous robots, whether it's artificial intelligence, we all have a responsibility to decide how that future arrives. There's a lot of fear and there's a lot of concern about the impact that robotics and automation will have in our lives. And those concerns are valid. We spend a lot of time discussing the future we don't want but now we have to start imagining the future we do want. The visions of robotics, you know, these stories from our past that talk about our future are really not the condition that we have in our present. We have something far more wondrous, full of machines that are super strong, are super fast, that can fly, that can move at incredible speeds. And we just have to create more human-centered ways for them to augment and expand our abilities and not replace them. So I hope a lot of this talk gets you excited about having an opinion about how these robots should come out and impact your life. For me, it's been really incredible to, again, work with a dozen robots and to talk to these machines every day, to observe how they move and go into their brain and tweak it a bit to see how they react to people. Thank you. Wow, that's extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. I can't wait to have a conversation afterwards with the panel. Uh, thank you, Madeline. Uh, all right, so we've seen an emerging talent in photography. Um, now we see an established talent in photography. Uh, Renner has been my friend for many years now. And uh, as a human being, uh, for me, she is uh, someone of the highest order I think she is arguably one of the greatest photographers in the world. Uh, because for me, she puts humanity first. And she is an extraordinary storyteller. So as a simple man, I asked her, how do you describe your job? And she said, I earn people's trust, and then I take their picture. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Renner. Thank you, Renner. Thank you, Platon, my friend. Um, thank you very much for coming. So this is a very strange portrait of me, and the reason why I'm sharing it with you is because I'm often asked, what's it, what is it like for you to be a woman photographer, and how does your gender affect your work? And my answer to that is that in my work, I'm a photographer first and a woman second. Now, this may sound strange, so I'll give you an example. I was eight months pregnant with my daughter when I went up to this a remote village in the mountains of Azerbaijan. It was very beautiful, and people there were hospitable, but still quite traditional in their values. And after a few hours of photographing in this village, I realized that nobody noticed my pregnancy. No one put their hand on my belly and asked me how far, far along I was. Was it a girl or a boy? No one offered me a chair to sit down and rest. And I, at some point, even, I told a woman that I was pregnant, and she looked at me in disbelief. And then it dawned on me that because I carry the camera, this professional tool, for the people there, they perceived me as a photographer and not as a woman. So in their mind, they blocked out my pregnancy altogether because it was as though I could not be both, right? As I travel around the world, I visit many remote places and often photograph very traditional societies, quite patriarchal as well. And I realize that the attitudes, this one curious thing, that the attitudes and the customs which prevail towards women in these places do not necessarily apply to me. I'm kind of genderless in that space as a professional, okay? And because they perceive me as someone with the power to tell a story, their story. And this power 
it changes the dynamics of gender and it allows me to gain access to these men. <laughs> and they can be powerful men, they could be village patriarchs or prominent leaders or militiamen. And they will see me as a photographer and not as a woman. Photography has empowered me and it has also enabled me to connect with many extraordinary people, but especially women. And probably many of you, the same as me, have grown up, I've grown up with a very different idea of what a female icon should be. When I was a child, I admired women that were beautiful, but in a very specific way. They were also fragile and in need of being saved. In fair tales and movies, Rarely did I see women that actually managed to save themselves. But the reality has always been different. And through my work, I met amazing women who have overcome unspeakable traumas, but their spirit remained strong. So today when I'm asked who your role model is, I think of these women, these real women that I met through my work. They're what we call ordinary women, but there's nothing ordinary about them. Their resilience and strength is something remarkable. Now, we've all been following this global campaign, the Me Too campaign, which enabled and galvanized so many brave people, men and women, to come forward with their testimonies of sexual harassment and abuse. But one thing in the mainstream media, we almost focused entirely on public you know, figures and celebrities, and we don't hear enough stories from regular survivors. So today I'd like to share with you some stories of very brave women who have overcome this culture of stigma and shame and spoken out. Over the years, I've spent some time in North Dakota on Spirit Lake Native American Reservation. And in this tightly knit community of about 2,000 people, I came across a very shocking statistic. That for every 62 residents of this reservation, there's at least one registered sex offender. Just a com in comparison, the sex offender ratio in Manhattan is 81,000 to one, and there is 62 to one. Most of these crimes take place in the people's homes. Now you might think it's your family, it's the safest place imaginable, but once these incidents take place, the trust is broken and the victims find themselves entrapped with no place to go. According to the tribal members, the majority of these crimes are not resolved because the family urges victims not to report the criminals due to stigma and shame. On Spirit Lake, I met a woman who was assaulted by several of her family members. She said she's been a victim of sex abuse since she was nine years old. Sometimes you have no choice but to go back to your family, she said. You still get hurt by them, but you end up going back. Sashin, she was raped by a family member when she was just 11 years old, and her grandmother said, shh, don't tell anybody. As a result, the man was not punished, the perpetrator, the criminal. He's walking free. In fact, he's her neighbor now, and she sees him through her kitchen window when she does her dishes. She says she keeps her head low to block him out of view. But Sashin today is no longer a child. So she's a grown woman and a mother herself now. And she doesn't want to keep her head low anymore, so she's finally breaking the wall of silence over this taboo subject in order to prevent these crimes from happening again and protect her children from abuse. At the public college library where she worked, she insisted on the sexual harassment policy to be instituted. Now, gender-based violence is widespread in our world and Spirit Lake was one example of a peaceful community where it has reached epidemic proportions, but this kind of violence is especially common in the zones of conflict, and here are some stories from Congo DRC. Women here have been systematically targeted, and rape has become the weapon of war. But again, individuals of incredible generosity of spirit rise above this landscape of despair. 
In Dungu DRC, I met Sister Angelique, local nun who sheltered orphans born out of rape by women who were once abducted by the Lord Resistance Army rebels. Sister Angelique also worked with um, female survivors of um, rape and sexual trauma. She bought plots of land for them and she taught them how to cultivate it. She gave them cooking classes to create job opportunities for women like Ruth, whose family members were killed by the LRA. Now, this is going to be a very hard story. I met Joanne in Gilima DRC. She survived a devastating act of violence. The LRA killed her husband in front of her and then they asked her if she wanted to be killed or tortured. She said she preferred to die, but they tortured her instead. They cut her lips off with a machete knife. It fell on my lap like a donut, she remembered. And then they sent her back to her village, mutilated, in order to instill fear in the others. So as I was photographing Joanne, I felt nervous, very intrusive with my camera. And I tiptoed around her. And she stood there calmly and she looked at me with a twinkle in her eye and said, when you're done with these pictures, can you please give one to me? I've never been photographed before. And then I stopped and I thought, wow, what a strong woman. When I look at her face, all I can think of is her trauma. But she sees her face in the mirror every day. And to her, it's just a face, her face. She's overcome the trauma. In my work, I'm constantly amazed at the ability of people to recover and adapt to some of the most gruesome circumstances. When I went to Chernobyl in 2010, I observed life resurging in a place that was once completely devastated by the world's more, most powerful nuclear disaster. What I saw there was something incredible. I saw wildlife <laughs> taking over spaces once inhabited by humans. Just like this tree growing through the floorboard of a gymnasium in a school in a city that was once inhabited by 40,000 people and now completely deserted. I saw footprints of wolf, you might wanna go there for your wildlife pictures, on the snow because they've just retaken those spaces. The cities are now inhabited by wolves and foxes. They call it the zone of alienation or the exclusion zone, a vast area around the nuclear, disaster, uh, nuclear reactor, the damaged reactor, which is restricted, access is restricted due to high levels of radioactive contamination. And there are some crazy thrill-seeking people who penetrate the zone illegally and hide in the, in the forests and you know, abandoned apartments and also there are some tourists who come in with special you know, guides carrying radiation uh, measuring devices. But other than those people, nobody else is allowed to venture into the zone. But a few women that were past their birth giving age were allowed to return just a couple of months after the explosion. So today they're elderly women who live alone. They've outlived their husbands. They live alone, their children moved away and all the men in, in the villages have died. When I met Hannah, she was 78 years old, native to Chernobyl, to Kapavati village. She survived the great famine of Ukraine, which was imposed by Soviet era blockade, when her neighbors, in order to survive, resorted to cannibalism and almost butchered her for food. She also lived through the Nazi occupation of Ukraine. And after the nuclear explosion, this woman chose to return to her homeland and resettle. Now, I watched Hannah run around her yard. She had this manic energy in a place in a ghost town that was inhabited by three people. So I asked her, Anna, you're not afraid of radiation? She said, radiation? No. What about starvation? I'm afraid of that. That's a real threat. <laughs> yeah. I met Nadezhda. Her house was next to the barbed wire fence around the Forbidden Forest. 
she snuck through the barbed wire into the forest to fetch berries for her winter preserves. When I see the police, I hide in the bushes. No one can stop me, she said. The food that these women harvested, grew, and ate in the zone was most probably contaminated with radiation, but they didn't seem to care or be affected by it. Many of the women I met there were also liquidators uh, during the disaster, which means that they were in charge of cleaning the, radi uh, the radioactive fallout. So some of them, as a result, developed um, thyroid cancers. So I asked them again and again, is the pool of your homeland so strong that you choose to return and resettle there in spite of all the dangers of radiation, in spite of all the ris risks? So one of them told me in response, a bird flies close to its nest. Those who have left all died of sadness. Okay. I live in Istanbul now. This is my new home. And unlike the women of Chernobyl, the three friends I met here did not have the same strong sense of belonging to their homeland. All three of them came from the countryside in Eastern Anatolia and settled in a big city because they felt they were outcasts back home. They were, biologically, they were born as men, but by gender, they identify as women. And it was through them that I learned about the liquidity of gender identity and about the dangers these women face daily just to preserve their right to define themselves, to say who they are. Sechil didn't want to cut communication back with her family you know, in her home village. So each time she went back to visit them, she had to disguise herself as a man. She put a strap on her chest to flatten her breast. She put on men's clothes and she dyed her hair black. The only good thing about being a Turkish trans, she told me, is that most Turkish names are gender neutral. Sechil could be a boy or a girl, so she didn't have to change her name. Yanke cut ties with, with, with all her family back home because they expected a traditional life out of her. They wanted her to find a wife and have children. But to her, she said, Marriage represented an encroachment on personal freedom. Helene, their friend, had very different views. She dreamed of starting a family. She told me, I want my husband to be a passionate and jealous man. I want him to call me every hour and ask me where I am. But in spite of their dreams and aspirations, many Turkish transgender migrants end up in the sex industry, working the streets, brothels and nightclubs of Istanbul. It's the only community where they feel accepted and the only job that's readily available for them. Transgender activist Cheval told me that there are still no discrimination laws in place, anti-discrimination laws in place, which would provide members of the LGBTQI community with equal and fair employment opportunities. She herself started off as a sex worker, but later got herself off the streets. But many of Cheval's friends continue working in the sex industry. For them, just walking the streets of Istanbul is an act of courage in itself because they face regular violence, both from clients and the police. Yanki told me that there are places in Istanbul where members of the LGBTQI community hang out where she can be accepted, but she says she doesn't like going there because to her that's accepting defeat. She said, I like to go to traditional places where I stand out and people stare at me. Let them stare, she said. I know I'm different, but I'm beautiful. Thanks to women like Yanke and the others that I've met in my work, I've come a long way in my perceptions of what a female icon should be. The social media has enabled us to open a debate about such taboo subjects as sexual harassment and assault. And more and more of these female voices are heard louder and clearer now. So for me as a woman, it's an exciting thing to watch, this paradigm shifting from the damsel in distress to a powerful individual who is not afraid to speak out. So today I'd like to celebrate the diversity of these new female icons 
and I hope that more of them will be stepping into the spotlight. Thank you very much. <laughs> I stay over there. <laughs> Thank you, Rena. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. What extraordinary people you are. And uh, I'm up here not because I like being on stage. I'm up here because I like learning from great people. So uh, let's have a very honest conversation um, as people who are fascinated with the human condition. And I, you know, I believe you must be so fascinated with the human condition because when I looked at your work, um, what was extraordinary is that the people who engage with the robots, it, it triggers a fascinating human response from the people. Mm -hmm. um, it was extraordinary, especially children, but grown-ups too. Mm -hmm. And it, it almost brings people back to the innocence of a child when they're experiencing something for the very first time. I remember when my children were babies, you know, you move your hand and, and, and they watch and they move with you and that's one of the first signs of connection. So I'd like to start with you, Madeline. Um, talk to me about what this idea is of connection um, and al almost empathy. And that's very interesting to hear the idea of empathy from you. Yeah, I think with the robotic installations that I do, they don't come to life until there's a person in front of it. Um, we often assume that robots need to be smart in order for them to connect with us in a meaningful way. but um, just by tapping into our primal instincts to read body language in things that move, you know, when we look at the socket in the wall, we see a face. You know, when we look at a fire hydrant, we see faces. We can't help but project our own animacy onto these things. So when I develop these installations, I'm often trying to just do little enough to let these machines be a vessel to receive our own empathy and our own emotion onto them. That's really what brings them to life, what, what builds that connection. But with a robot, I mean, Ren is talking uh, a lot about um, um, the idea of uh, being a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't tell whether those robots were masculine or feminine. Mm -hmm. Some, I think, you referred to as feminine. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as, as a man, I didn't see signs of either. Mm -hmm. And yet there was some extraordinary reaction from the robot to the person, and person to the robot. Um, does gender have anything to do with what you're, with what you're working on? Um, or have you found something that has nothing to do with gender? One of the wonders about working with a mechanical species um, that doesn't reproduce is that gender doesn't really need to be a part of it. Um, I think that, that there are ways that we can begin to explore alternative futures that we can't quite get out of with when we're talking about animals or people with these invented species that we're able to put out into the world. So for me, I think the, a lot of what I'm thinking about is just the fact that giving someone your undivided attention is just this act of generosity that pulls you in to wanting to engage. And the robots, you know, robots are usually defined by their utility, um, what they do, what tool, what are they good for? You know, but no one asks a lion, well, what does that lion do? Well, the lion exists. The lion eats and lays around and gets bored and walks away. And when we have intelligent machines out there living on their own, independent of us, why shouldn't they have those same abilities to um, and navigate the world in a, in a way that we're familiar with as humans. Sky, so um, I was really struck by the emotion in your pictures. I thought that was, I think that was so powerful. And uh, you can almost see the same power of emotion in every picture you take, your favorite ones. Uh, that you felt were very, the, the, the <laughs> ones that you felt were successful and I, and I really, loved the way you were very open about your journey. Uh, very few artists dare to show work in progress. And uh, that shows, I think, great courage in you as an artist, to be honest. 
And it does add value and it helps us all appreciate when you really do reach that point that you're searching for and you get there, we all appreciate the, the magic of that too with you. Um, but the pictures that you uh, presented to us as the ones that you regarded as successful, they all had this extraordinary emotion. And it was very moving. I mean, I almost choked up a, a couple of them. Uh, because you, you create this sort of, um, I, I mean, I can't say humanity in animals, <laughs> but you certainly create the majesty, you reflect the majesty of what it is to be alive. Well, what I like to try and show with my photography is the human in the animal, that animals do have feelings. When I look at a leopard's eyes and it looks back at me, I know that it's just not looking blankly at something. It's trying to figure out who is this person, why are they taking photos of me? And with that, I try to reflect the intimacy in how the animals should be regarded as having a soul. They feel. They believe in things. They do certain things. You'll go from one leopard to another leopard. You'll go from one lion to another lion. They'll do completely different things at different times of days. And do so it's completely different individuality is what I like to try and capture in my photos. And the essence that people and animals aren't so far alike that we like to describe them as and that we should al almost regard them as one and the same. I like to think of it as, for the elephant, I showed an elephant being shot. Would you like to be shot? And I feel like you still have to go through the pain. The animal still has to go through that. But the people don't think of it like that. So I try to capture that in my pictures. You know, we need storytellers today to help us under t understand the times we're living in. And, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, um, the environment, I think uh, th the way you tell a story is, is extremely powerful and it helps us all appreciate, you know, th the magic of nature. Um, so, Rena, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think as well as your beautiful pictures, uh, it's your storytelling that uh, is, is also very powerful. Um, it's, it's very clear to me as, as a fellow photographer that, you know, you the relationship between you and your subjects is comes first. Um, th you have to earn their trust. And I've learned that over the years, as I showed with that little girl. Couldn't have taken that picture unless I earned her trust. Um, you operate on a very high level with, with building a relationship and learning about their story. So how what does empathy mean to you as a storyteller? <coughs> uh, for me, the the first and the f foremost uh, emotion is honesty. Honesty is something that I come with to the people. I tell them why I'm there, and I'm, I tell them what I'm going to do and what you know impact it might have. And I tell them, you know, uh, my own story as well. So it's a dialogue. It's it's always almost always a dialogue. Empathy is something that's uh, inherent in, in, in the photographer who is concerned with human condition. So without empathy, we can't take those pictures. Mm -hmm. It's just impossible. Now, you come close to the elephants. I once was on, on assignment photographing a woman who saved elephants. I came close to her, but I used the rider as a human shield to stay away from the elephants, okay? So it's, we connect on a different level. You connect with the animals, and I connect with the people, and it's just, and you connect with the robots and the people. So it's just the way we operate um, and what is closest to us. And empathy is something that builds up within the work, at, as, f as long as we're honest and direct about what we're doing and not exploiting the subject. Is it very difficult? Um, I mean, we, we've seen many photojournalists Mm -hmm. and photographers and filmmakers in the media uh, when they're dealing with people <coughs> and animals and the environment and with technology, uh, it's very easy to get it wrong as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly with the uh, human rights issues that uh, I've worked on, I've seen so many people get it wrong and they, they almost abuse the situation. It's being exploitative. For the, uh, exploitative. Yeah. So, um, again, that goes back to integrity and mm -hmm. trust, but also respect for your yeah. subject. Can you talk a little bit about that and how hard it is to, to have that as the, the, the fundamental ingredient in your work? 
I, I think, the, yeah, the most important for me is not to show pity, but to show dignity of the people I photograph, uh, because I, I'm not there to just evoke compassion, but I'm also there to uh, inspire people to look at them not as victims, but as survivors. I mean, I'm, I'm showing, I'm telling stories and showing these portraits of people who have survived completely unspeakable traumas, okay? And they've come around, they've turned their lives around and normalized their lives. They've moved on. They are taking care of others. They have families. They have homes, you know? So that takes strength. That takes incredible strength. And I want people, when they look at these portraits, I want them to admire this strength, this ability of people to survive, adapt, recover, this spirit, you know, the resilience of human spirit. And that is, has always been the main theme in my work, and that's what I try to evoke in the pictures that I take. And just to cut in with the human spirit thing, I don't yeah. think that it's just all about the humans, but the animals that I've photographed, especially mm -hmm. Limpy the leopard, she's broken her leg. By all means and purposes, she should be dead. Yeah. I've seen lion cubs with malfunctions. They've been born wrong. They're missing legs. And yes. still, they make it. I think you're completely right. I think it's something animalistic in us, <laughs> in a way that drives us to survival. I think that's, that's inherent in our nature, in our DNA. Yeah. So, Sky, when you talked about the picture of the leopard, first we saw the picture, and it's an extraordinary image. Um, we're drawn to it. As you said before, there's a soul. I think it's that thing that's, that really gets us about your work. Uh, but when you added the fact that her n the name you gave her came from an injury and how she had struggled and overcame, and now she, uh, she has babies, uh, we, we find ourselves uh, attached to your story and moved by your story even more. So I, I tell me a bit about, I mean, that's, that's going to become, as you continue your journey as a storyteller, it's, it's expanding the narrative to a fuller picture that really helps us have empathy with the subject. Yeah, no, especially with a leopard that I've been following for such a long time and a bloodline that I'm hopefully going to be following for many years to come. It's more of that intimacy that I feel like with the whole feeling of uh, the human spirit, mm -hmm. the soul, you can feel that with, a, with especially with her. When I'm around her, as you can see, if you saw in the picture, she's not looking at me. She's looking past me. Mm -hmm. I'm not so concerned. She's looking at something else. And that's what draws people in. It's the intimacy and the fact that I'm just, an, I'm just a person. Mm -hmm. She's just an animal. We're both on this planet together. And mm -hmm. I think that's what's really special. And that's the kind of thing. What is she thinking? That's what's going on in people's minds when they look at it. So let's just, uh, let you're very eloquent. Okay. Let's just take exactly what you just said and then move it over to you, Marianne. <laughs> because I'm just a person, she's just an animal, and we're connecting. So let's replace the animal with a robot. Mm -hmm. I'm just a person. Uh, I think her name was Abba, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which Abba. I thought was great. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and she's just a robot. She's just a dancing queen. She's a dancing queen. <laughs> and there's a connection, there is, because the, the robot is connecting in a, in a mechanical way. Mm -hmm. But the person is connecting in a human way. Yes. I don't think that those children who were, those teenagers who were dancing with the robots mm -hmm. uh, and the adults too, were really thinking about the, uh, the, the technicalities. Yes. Yeah. I think they were responding in an instinctive human way. Mm -hmm. There's this object that seems lifeless and mm -hmm. yet it seems full of life. Can you talk about that relationship of empathy that you clearly have created with robots? Yeah, I think a lot of what I do is, again, to try to get these machines to be a vessel for our emotion. And that that's, there's a powerful connection when you have something that's so foreign and so alien and seems so outside your world, um, inaccessible to you, this high-tech thing that I'm kind of scared of. But then it looks right at you, it looks through you, it engages with you in a way. And even though that relationship is still one-sided, right, it's me projecting my emotion into it and getting the feedback from it, it's still very powerful. I think it's still very valid. We have a lot of 
one-sided with relationships in our life with maybe our pets that only like us when we feed them or celebrities that we admire from afar. And they all add meaning to our life. And I think that's what I'm trying to chase when thinking about what our future with these machines are, is trying to push them from being useful to meaningful contributors in our life. How are they gonna make our life better, not just more efficient? And that's not generally a question that, that uh, roboticists ask. I mean, it, you could say, um, you know, the children that were looking at the robots, we all project ourselves into either our friends, every relationship mm -hmm. we have. Uh, the on the receiving end, it may be a completely different part of the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the robots, you know, uh, a little black girl will look at a robot and project her sense of self mm -hmm. onto the robot. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who has a completely different cultural identity uh, or even gender might uh, look at the robot and project themselves onto the robot. Mm. So in a weird way, uh, I mean, we all do that in our relationships to some extent, but this is a sort of certainly an extreme version of this amazing capacity to project and you see yourself in the responses from something that is essentially soulless and mechanical. Just a pile of metal and motors, mm -hmm. really. But they're projecting a soul <laughs> onto it. Yes. And that's what's interesting. There isn't actually a soul there. Mm but they are projecting a soul into the machine. And I feel like it doesn't make it any less valid, the fact that it's that one-sided. So then the times we're living in, we are, everyone's talking about the emergence of technology. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Klaus Schwab has said that um, we need to rethink how we structure our society these days mm -hmm. because technology is moving faster than the infrastructure of society, whether it's politics, whether it's business. And we now have to recalibrate as much as we did after the Second World War. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now, with that statement comes an inherent anxiety about technology, that technology is moved faster. It and we, humanity is being left behind. Mm. So I put it to you, uh, the balance between optimism and pessimism. Mm. How do you feel about the times we're living in and and uh, the adjustments that we need to make in society to catch up, mm -hmm. but also how do we continue to drive forward with technology, mm -hmm. uh, but still have a respect for the, the human soul that yeah. even you catch in animals? Yeah. yeah, I think all of us on this stage are optimists at heart. I mean, we don't have stories of victims, we have stories of survivors. We have stories of resilience, not stories of defeat. We have stories of inclusivity, not stories of exclusion with tech. Um, and it's a, it's a perspective that I think we need more of, right? We, we know what we don't want in this world. We, we don't want people to be exploited. We don't want animals to be um, uh, dominated over. We don't want robots to take over. For technology, we're at an early enough point that we don't have to be reactionary. We can be anticipatory and begin to think out how that future is actually going to arrive. We're at a very special moment in time. We're really at a threshold point where the uh, technological advances are just starting to happen now. If we can come together as a society and begin to decide how that future arrives, then we don't have to um, begin to think about conservation, begin to think about how we fix what we broke. We can begin to anticipate it in a way that um, includes everyone in that future. So I know for me with my wildlife photography, I'm very passionate about keeping wildlife wild. And with technology, with how fast it's growing, a lot of my friends in particular, they don't want to go into the woods. They don't want to experience nature. They c it doesn't have a good enough reception. You know, it's stuff like that where I think we have to find a way to both merge technology and nature and to bring them together because it's only then that we can actually say that we, not we don't have to react we can think ahead. We don't have to fix problems because they're not gonna happen. Rena, uh, you've talked a lot about resilience. Um, and clearly, almost uh, so many of the people you photographed have experienced the darkest corners of life. Um, and yet, you do tap into their resilience. You do tap into their um, strength and their capacity to overcome. 
um, especially with your storytelling. So when you look at the times that we are experiencing right now, and uh, there's a lot of pessimism and anxiety around, partly because of social media tribalism. Um, but uh, would, how do you look at what we're experiencing as a global community? Uh, as a person who's dealt with such dark issues, difficult issues, and yet always found optimism in them, how do you look at the society at large right now? Well, I think as long as we're sharing these stories, um, that's important because you know you can have an audience of uh, people that understand it very well, but then you'd be preaching to the choir. But then I'd rather have an audience that doesn't understand it, and then perhaps they'll walk away with something, mm -hmm. and they'll think about it, and perhaps I'll tell them something new. So I think reaching out through, by whatever means, be it social media or mainstream media or uh, anything, any other media that exists, and telling those stories and, and reaching out is, is, is important. I mean, this is why I do this. You know, I don't only do it to make you know, beautiful portraits of people, but my main goal is to inform of, you know, inform people of what's happening. You know, and often you, you are in a situation when a magazine picks up a story and they say, no, but it, we have no place for it, you know. So I'll take the story and I'll go to Instagram. I will go somewhere else. I'll do a radio interview. I will, whatever it takes. <laughs> so crossing all platforms, and that's very important for me. Are there any questions from members of the audience? I mean, we're so lucky to have, here we go, we're so lucky to have these people. And I think this is a fascinating conversation. So, uh, uh, yes, sorry, there's a gentleman behind you, and you can go next. Oh. <laughs> okay, ladies first. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, <coughs> hello, my name is Christian Lajaj. I come from Croatia. Uh, I've come a long way, but it was definitely worth it to, to come to Open Forum Davos. Uh, I have a question for Ms. Gannon. Um, so this is truly amazing uh, what you presented today, and... Honestly, I didn't know that people are doing these kinds of things. Um, so my question is just, can you already uh, at, at this moment envisage, for example, what will happen in this uh, specific job and technology that you're doing in, in five or 10 years? Mm -hmm. Will we have a, a, a robot moderating in open forum in 2029? Or, or, or this is uh, maybe yet too, too far to think how uh, the development will will go on uh, in the next five to 10 years? Thank you. No, I think that's a great question. A lot of what I try to do is use existing technology. So those robots, they've been around for about 50 years. They're considered the dinosaurs of the robotics world. Um, but what I try to show is that if you can design how they engage with people in a more human-centered way, that you can begin to misuse that tool for more productive and meaningful ends. We're really at a point where the, all the technology, all the ingredients are here. They can get stitched together in a million different ways. And what's lacking now is the imagination for what to do. So the answer is yes, whatever example you're going to give, it can be there in five years. It could probably be there three months, right? The, both the installations, they were developed from scratch in about three months, from you know assembly line robot to living mechanical creature in three months' time. Um, we're living at this great point where the technology is also democratizing. So I don't think, I, I, I'm originally trained as an architect, not as a roboticist. And I don't think if I got into this 10 years ago that I would have had access to the knowledge I would need to begin to understand how to cross over from the more cultural and humanities into the technological. So it's a pretty incredible time that w we're really limited now by our imagination, not by our technology. Sounds like I'm gonna be out of a job in, uh, in three <laughs> or four years, no, and no. you're gonna have a computer and a, a, a robot. Um, but but I, I, think th I think the goal is really to find ways for a human and a machine to be better than the sum of their parts. Mm -hmm. That's yes. at least my agenda. But it's interesting to, s to hear that you were an architect mm. uh, or because 
that helps us think about what you're doing in a completely different way. Mm. I mean, a, a, an architect designs art that you live in, yeah. that empowers your life. And you, you, it, it's shelter. Mm. And perhaps a robot can do the same thing, yeah. play a similar relationship to humanity. Mm -hmm. And yet we are constantly feeling anxiety that we're threatened by the emergence right. of robots. We're never threatened by the emergence of a house. Mm. Um, so it, it helps me understand this sort of um, trajectory in a totally different way. Uh, th there was a lady over there that had a question. My name is Shermina, and I'm, uh, I came from Ottawa, Canada. Um, I'm in the blockchain cryptocurrency space, and I also deal with the same AI. This is a question for everyone, including yourself, Planton. So um, I'm wondering, just to piggyback off the response you gave of humanity and, um, and robotics sort of growing together, how do you all work to make sure people benefit from your work? So when you take photographs, do these people get some incentive from your, co you know, get compensated for when you sell this photo to Reuters? You know, do they get a percentage? Or do you, um, in terms of robotics, do you do anything for the labor community? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who have lost their jobs in the car industry for GM, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, do you try, do you, are you part of training efforts to mm -hmm. retrain? Uh, those are my questions, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I mean, Sky, do you want to talk about that? Well, I know with my photography, it's mainly focused at wildlife. So my priority is to help preserve the wildlife, not to so much the human uh, factor of it. But in saying that, the wildlife is one of the biggest uh, forms of ways that people can get involved in it. So people do benefit from wildlife spiritually, educationally, and in a lot of ways. Um, I've donated uh, many of my pictures to the Mad Foundation, which empowers people, leaders in Africa to do it, make a difference and to help better the environment as well as better the system, uh, our economy. So stuff like that, I do believe that it does play a very important role. And I think that the best person to lead this on next is the people next to me. <laughs> uh, Rena, do you want to talk about this? Because I sure. think it's a really complicated question it for is. photographers who deal with the human condition, especially documentary photographers. So, would you like to it talk? It is, yeah. It's it's very it's very complex, and um, there is always a dividing line between a photographer who informs, and then an organization, perhaps an NGO, that takes action uh, on on something that we see. And and the way that I see our role mainly is to inform, because without us taking these issues out to the public, the public will not know. I think there was once an example of a French newspaper that published one day without any pictures. And it was, it was weird. You see text, and instead of pictures, they had empty blocks of nothing. And it was a completely weird and surreal experience. And that's when you realize that that's it. They are important. Now, as far as how it trickles down to the people we photograph, that's very tricky to say, because uh, often we don't know. We're not often living in these places where we take photographs, we, we, we get sent there, we spend time, you know, sometimes over years, sometimes it could be five days, sometimes it could be one day, and then we go back. But I think uh, the fact that we are informing the public is, is, is something that, you know, I can say is something very, very useful for all of us. I hope <laughs> it is. But uh, I would like to add that you guys play a role in this too. Yeah, you because are the ones taking action. <laughs> we, we are sending the images out mm -hmm. to you for mm -hmm. a clear response. And I can say that I once photographed an amazing young lady called Anna, who is an LGBT uh, activist in Russia. And on the eve, uh, I, had, I had spent a lot of time with her and, and we got a beautiful portrait and I did an interview with her. So um, on the eve of the Sochi Olympics, uh, she was um, uh, campaigning for, for rights in the streets with a sign, and apparently she was arrested. And uh, we heard about this in my office in New York. So I released the picture to the global media, and it allowed the global community to talk about this issue with a face matching the story. And within 48 hours, I believe she was released. And I can give another example of a doctor 
that uh, uh, heals women from sexual violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where Rena did this incredible work. He, he became a friend of mine and, and invited me to his hospital in the DRC. And I spent six years working with him, and I've just made a film about him. And 10 days after I finished making the film, uh, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. So tonight, I'm actually screening the film. The pr world premiere is here in this room in about two hours. Congratulations. And he's been invited as my guest to Davos. And I've spent two days in meetings with royalty, with heads of state and government, uh, offering him an enhanced platform of leadership so he can persuade people to think differently. So there are many different ways we as communicators and storytellers drive change. It's a really good question, and it's a question that we, I'm sure we all struggle with, and we, yeah. we have to struggle with it, because if we don't struggle with it, we are not really uh, thinking through the sensitivity of this issue. Um, and I'm sure everyone deals with it in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Madeline, do you want to talk about that? Because Yeah, for me, a lot of a lot of the decision making that I do is choosing what not to work on. So I have a lot of technical skill that can be applied for automation, that can be applied for integration, that can be applied towards replacing people with more efficient processes. Um, but in, instead, I choose to scout out what our future with these machines could be, alternative futures, and, and hopefully inspire others to find different paths as well. I think, you know, for me, it, I want a breath, you know, breath first search for what the future will be, as many possible alternatives as possible. That's how we find the one that we want to go towards. We all have uh, gifts. In my case, I have less gifts than normal, but we all have something. You all have something. And the question is um, not whether we are the best in the world at mm -hmm. this thing. The question is how do we apply what we know uh, and what we believe we're good at to something positive that drives positive change. And I'm only a storyteller, all right? So, uh, you know, I, I don't know a lot about global politics. I'm not an intellectual, clearly. But uh, I am good at telling stories. So if I really focus on that, then I can do something positive with that. And then the question is, we put it back to you. What can you do? And everybody in this room can do something. Uh, so there's a gentleman over there who has a question, and then I think we should probably wrap up. Thank you. Um, I'm a journalist from Zimbabwe. Um, mm. My name is Simba Chikanza. I'm sure you've all been reading the news lately in the last few days. We won't talk about that. Yeah, to the yes. Um, I'm a journalist from Zimbabwe. My name is Simba Chikanza. And uh, I would like to throw a hint, at the same time throw a question. Uh, regarding storytelling and have you noticed that a lot of the times some of the best stories or content shall I put that put it across that way do not seem to get across the receivers so you might want like I'll give an example I'm forgetting her name but she had <laughs> and I'm great her, yes yeah you had, uh, you, you've got so many of these crucial stories that the whole world must pay attention to. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I love the way you graphically put it across there. But have you noticed that a lot of what you have, people don't seem to pay attention to it? And, and, and you know, when, when yet there are possibly millions, if not tens of millions of people who are affected by, for instance, just one of your pictures. So my question tonight is, have we all paid attention to the complexity of storytelling? And I'm gonna give this, throw it as a hint, maybe for another day, but I just want to say, I've discovered that every time when we say something, we're only communicating to just one over 12th of the human brain. Uh, and, and I've, I have, I've, I've proved this mathematically, even physiologi physiologically, <laughs> I've proved um, um, recently 
that yes, many times we've got some of these crucial, crucial messages that the whole world must know about. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this as a journalist, and you find that a lot of the times our content just wastes, goes to the waste. Why? Because there is a, there is a, a factor there. Every time when we communicate something, Right now, what I'm speaking to you, I'm only communicating to one over twelfth of your brain. So for you to understand my message, I'm going to have to repeat it <laughs> 12 times to you for you to really get to. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be, yeah, I'm going to be. Th yeah. that, that's, why, that's why advertising is so powerful. <laughs> no advertising agency ever runs one commercial once. <laughs> that these people are smart. They know that you keep <laughs> You keep doing it again and again and again. You never listen to one of your favorite songs once. Mm. You play it again and again until you start to anticipate those beautiful rhythms or sounds or melodies. A, a story is the same. And I'm going to give a hint of something that people don't know about right now. Okay. Quickly. What's happening in Zimbabwe right now? A lot of you would not have seen this. All you've just been seeing is just the flashes in the news. But what you don't realize, the man who's calling himself the president of Zimbabwe right now, in the space of just a few months, he's killed more black people, more black people than apartheid South Africa. Anyone heard that in the news lately? Anyone? You see, that's just an example. And yet, and yet, we're paying attention to other things. And we're calling this man a president when he's actually a terrorist. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think, look, you, you're saying something that's actually interesting because it means that the stakes are high. It means that our responsibility as, storytelling, as storytellers is, is, is very important. And we <laughs> have to be effective. And uh, right now, as I, s as I say, we're, we're facing a tsunami of white noise. And we can't tell what is important and what isn't, what is accurate and what is not. So it's the job of a storyteller to uh, give an enhanced platform of leadership to emerging leaders. It's the job of a storyteller to tell uh, an important positive story or, or a frightening story that's, that's accurate uh, and, and make sure that we in society are so moved that uh, we change our minds and we change our actions. But it just means that we have to work very, very hard now. We never used to have to work this hard before. But I'm a believer in, in storytelling and the skill and the art of storytelling. And data isn't enough. And I think maybe to your point, if we just offer data to an audience, we can't relate to that data. It has to be humanized. Absolutely. And perhaps the, the, even with the robots, when, when you bring some humanity to the robots, mm -hmm. the response between people and that connection is transformative mm -hmm. and it's the same with wildlife and it's the same with the human condition. So it's the connection that really counts. So um, I'd like to just round this up. I wanna thank my panel for being, I mean, you've all been uh, very honest and sincere and I found this personally fascinating. Um, so I'm gonna end with a, with a little story about the idea of um, uh, belonging. So um, I had the great honor to work with Muhammad Ali once, and I spent the day in his house. And uh, he was very ill at the time. Uh, he was suffering from this condition we all know as Parkinson's disease. And in fact, this was the last ever photo session he did before he passed away. So um, I said to him, Muhammad, you are the greatest. That's what your name is. I said, teach me to be great. How can my generation be as great as your generation had to be during the civil rights era in America? Now, he couldn't speak very well. He could barely mumble. So I had to get very close to him, and he whispered something in my ear. And he said, I have a confession to make. So I said, what is it? And he said, I wasn't as great as I said I was. <laughs> oh, my God, I said. I'm devastated. That's the biggest confession I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Everybody thinks you're the greatest person ever. So then he said, you misunderstand me. I'll tell you what was great, he said, and it wasn't me. It was that people saw themselves in my struggle. 
It was that people saw themselves in my story. And then he turned it to me. And now I have the great privilege to turn it back to you. And I say, if you can get people to see themselves in the stories that we present to you, then we have a chance of achieving greatness. And that's never us. That's something much bigger called bridge building. We can only heal our fractures if we think about building bridges between man and machine and technology, between man and animals and nature, and between man and man or man and woman. So with that said, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. And this has been a very inspiring conversation. And I'm just so honored to be on the stage with such great people. Thank you very much.